So my talk is uh, Styling React. Uh, I struggled with a subtitle for this presentation because, um, you know, it's just I'm talking about styling, I'm talking about CSS. Um, how do I define really my point here? Um, uh, Richard, my colleague, who's right there in the middle with the flannel, he came up, he actually, the, my, my original title was the or how I learned to stop worrying. Um, but, you know, I kind of wanted to say, I wanted to give some credit to to the inline uh, style style argument, and so Richard had a really good idea for calling it the eighty twenty rule, which I think is a good a uh, good way to go. Um, uh, my name is Eric. I work at Aruba Networks uh, currently. Um, got all my stuff here. Um, I've been doing web de development for about twelve years now, I suppose. Uh, started out be, uh, doing web design. Uh, kind of got into programming via that, just doing websites and designing things. Um, and I've been doing React now for two years, full time now. Um, so I've never looked back since I, since I found it. It's just been, it's transformed like how I think about everything um, for for the web. I, don't, I would couldn't imagine doing anything any other way. Um, so why the, why am I giving this talk? Why why now? Um, well, I don't know if you probably feel like this a lot. <laughs> I, I sure I sure do. Um, CSS fatigue is a real thing, just like there's JavaScript fatigue. Um, I, I kind of want to, I'm giving this talk mainly because, you know, even though CSS can make you feel like this, it, I think the web community, stays, uh, you know, stands to gain a lot by improving it instead of completely abandoning it. Um, so you ha show of hands who has heard of the problems with CSS presentation that, that Chris Shadow uh, infamously gave uh, about a year ago. Um, uh, the main main thing I'm going to talk about tonight is, is how these problems can really be solved without resorting to inline. Um, but how the inline actually, there's a lot, of, a lot of good use case for some of these problems with, for inline style. So I'm not totally eschewing it. I'm really going to talk about kind of a balance between the two worlds, uh, the two approaches rather, to solving the problems that, that he's outlined. Because they're, they're really, good, really good problems that he pointed out here. Um, and it's something that the web community and, and CSS in general um, stands to solve to, to sort of make things better. Has anyone tried uh, inline styles at, at, in, in the ways that he recommends, if you're familiar with his approach? I, I'm just curious if, if there's a lot of people who have tried doing that. Got a couple, one hand here. Um, I've, I found, so I, when I started out, um, I first heard the presentation, I was really excited about it, of course. There was a lot of good reasons to support the ideas here. Um, I built, I think, a small app once where it was like I had some SAS mixins that, that kind of set base styles. So there was still some CSS, but it was, most, it was one of those things I kind of just didn't think about because it was just kind of like, here's where I'm starting from. I have all these CSS you know, styles that I've already gotten set up for my, my page. And um, I, I was able to use inline for pretty much all of the custom styles that I needed to build for this page that I was trying to build. Uh, it, granted, it was a really small like landing page for like a social media ad. Um, it wasn't a huge big app like some things out there are. Um, and I felt like it worked pretty well. It, it probably, there probably was a lot of things you could, you know, poke holes in. But um, I think when you start talking, talking about like bigger apps, bigger things, bigger scale, it starts to become a problem when, you, um, when you're using it too much inline because that's what I'm going to go into. I'm going to talk about some of, those, some of those issues with that. Um, so I think really we can, we can solve all these problems and still retain all the benefits of CSS. Uh, so that's really the crux of what I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, first, of the, I think a discussion without... Um, and even enough discussion on CSS's problems wouldn't be complete without you know in the problem discussing what what issues there are with inline because if you're going to switch to inline you might as well know what those caveats are um, and keep in mind the the list I'm coming I came up with is not really it's not exhaustive at all I'm sure uh, it's just the ones I could compile from my own research uh, and observations uh, and I'm sure you can think of more if you can let me know I would love to you know have more information about some things that I just hadn't thought of yet. Um, and so a lot of people say that a uh, CSS and JS approach uh, fixes the, like the cascading problem. Um, so it turns out like, you know, inline um, in, on the web, there's still some styles that do cascade. So if you have, you know, say font color set on the body tag, everything in that, everything below the body, which is pretty much your whole app is going to, is going to get that font uh, style. Um, and, and, you know, the problem with cascading is that, you know, you have, if you have poorly constructed CSS or you have too much CSS and there's a lot of, you know, elements, type selectors all over the place that are, um, basically styling everything of one type, you know, like a div or something. Um, and you have to end up, you have to end up writing a lot of overrides. Um, that, that is really where the cascade problem becomes in real, you know, that's where it becomes really an issue. 
Um, but what I'm going to argue tonight is that if you adopt um, some some real good ground rules for your CSS, you won't really you can really minimize this problem, almost completely eliminate it, without any you know set, without any tooling, just 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 standard best practices for how to organize things. Um, and I think part of I'm not sure if a lot of the reason uh, behind the inline style argument came because it was from Chris Chideau, who's React Native. Uh, he's really the React Native guy. I'm not sure if it, a lot of it has to do with that. Obviously, probably those two worlds, you know, there's, there's some differences with how they, they're handled. So that's probably where he's coming from. He's coming from that world of React Native where this isn't an issue there. So <clears throat> uh, another problem is that, you know, because inline's got the most specificity, it wins that war. Um, so when you're talking about, for example, um, you know, open sourcing components, uh, say you have some code you want to share with the world, um, the inline is going to win that. If you if you decide to style your component with with purely inline styles, you're essentially forcing your users to use inline, um, not giving them the option to even style things because they've used inline for everything. So you have to essentially, you know, to override things unless they've given you a, a, an escape hatch, some way to override the styles that they provided, um, which you can do obviously with React. So there's you know good use cases for that. I'm sure that you can make an argument for. Um, but you know, using important, you'd have to. Do that for like everything. If you wanted to customize something that was like somebody open sourced, <clears throat> um, another it turns out that you know inline really does bloat the DOM to the point where it actually does affect performance. But for rendering, so there's that there's that downside. If you have your whole entire app and all the styles built for it, like rendering to your DOM, not only is your DOM just going to look supremely ugly, but it's going to actually affect performance at some point because you're bloating the crap out of it. Um, so that's kind of self-explanatory. Um, and like I was saying before, with open source, it's not it's not the best for open source friendliness um, because of that reason I was just stating. Um, a real example of this that I f came across is the React Select uh, element, which I think Jed Watson is the guy who created that. Um, and I've recently been working with that, um, and he has a really I, I've really dug into his code a lot and seen um, his his architecture is a really good model. I'd say it's he uses SAS to compile all of the styles for. What's really a complicated component? It has it has uh, basically it's a standard drop down, but it allows you to do multiple element selections. Um, you know, similar to like a tag a tag storm kind of thing. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of state changes, a lot of things going on, a lot of a lot of need to style all those elements. So you want you want to put this in your web, you want to put this on your app, and you need to make the colors match your branding. Um, well, he did a great job with of putting everything inside like CSS SAS variables. Um, SAS variables is a great a great way to make make your the API exposed to the outside world so that people using your component will be able to style it the way they want to, to style it and not rely on someone else's opinion about how that should look. Um, so uh, browsers can't cache inline too. That's another problem, right? Because the files that are sent over the wire um, take advantage of HTTP, you know, the HTTP caching that browsers support. So if you have all your styles in inline, you can't take advantage of that performance boost. Um, and um, another thing that I didn't, that wasn't apparent to me at first was that, you know, and then I realized was that if you do inline on each um, component in your app, every page refresh is a complete reload, you know, of all the styles. So all the objects have to get re repurposed into the DOM. So that's a lot of overhead. That you wouldn't have to worry about if your CSS was already preloaded, it was cached, and it was ready to go when your DOM was changing. Wouldn't have to do that. Um, and you probably heard the mantra. I don't know if you follow it enough with with some stuff, but I found some articles that say like some people argue that inline lets you use JavaScript, so you won't have to learn CSS. <laughs> um, so you know the problem is that inline style there is still technically CSS. You still have to learn like what that is. Um, so to me, that's not a great argument, but nevertheless, some people say that that's that's something that, that, that supports their idea to use that. Um, and and reinventing the CSS wheel is another one. Um, the CSS makes things a lot of things easy: media queries, hover focus events, um, you know, pseudo selectors, JSON selectors, direct children, sibling combinator selectors, anything that you can, all all those things you'd be missing out on within line, or you'd have to re-implement. Uh, either yourself or use tooling that someone else has to spend time building um, when you could just be you know building your app and not worrying about all these things um, and CSS, so in the problem with you know people um, relying on other others to build these kind of tools for you is that you get lock in um, 
and fatigue, because you know you got to spend all the time looking at these solutions. If you choose to go inline, you have to figure out what tools you're going to use to to make your life easier, because you're going to need it at some point. I've I've done it with uh, Radium. Uh, Radium is a probably one you've heard of heard of. That's that's one of the most popular ones out there. I think for doing inline and basically allowing you to do pseudo selectors like um, hover and media queries and that kind of thing uh, within CSS and JS. Um, and while it works, it's still extra. It's extra work that has to be put on the developer to integrate into their into their um, into their app, and also for the maintainers of those projects to keep those up to date. You know, as the web's changing, and as they, you know, there's obviously there's fe features you can dream up that like CSS is probably giving you out of the box that you would have to build yourself uh, and maintain. So, and the last point I'll make about inline is that CSS is a universal thing. It's been around since the web began. Um, and you know how many people here work with designers? Designers that build your app. Yeah, I mean, pretty much every, almost everybody probably has. If if you don't have a dedicated person doing it, you're going to need that function at some point. Um, and designers speak CSS. It's a it's an ubiquitous thing in the world. Uh, lots of useful CSS codes have been written. There's there's many libraries out there. Bootstrap Foundation, or just to, just to name a few. Um, and React. There's React ports to all those things now, so you don't have to even. Do it the old way. You can do it with React now, and it's just um, kind of amazing, really, to think about all the stuff that's been written with CSS. Um, you couldn't use any of that if you switched to inline. Um, so, what, what, what's the solution? How do we how do we actually solve this issue without having to adopt all these downsides to to this approach? So, what I'm calling the 80% CSS, 20% inline rule. Um, that's kind of what I'm sort of calling it, and, and it's not necessarily about exactly 80/20 because your app's going to change. It's going to be different every time. Um, it's going to, you know, it might be 90/10. It might be like 99/1. Who knows? You know, you might have more CSS than any inline, but um, kind of a good just kind of rule of thumb. Uh, and the other important point I want to emphasize first is that um, CSS best practices will greatly help you in this in this way too. Before you even start looking at tooling, so that's what I'm going to talk about. <clears throat> So we're going we're gonna to revisit these problems here um, from this perspective and see, see where we get at the end. Um, and I was saying before, if you, before you even get into tooling, and it's, it's tempting to sort of do that. You know, it's tempting to sort of start, start looking at things that are out there to help you. Um, I think a lot of what's missing with the, the JS community, though, in general, is that there's a lot of misunderstanding of how CSS works, but there's also just not an, much of awareness of, of CSS best practices or even just how it works in general. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so before you even act, think about adding tools to your stack, think to, let's take a step back and look at these. Look at these um, from a, from a high level. Um, so with layout, um, there's a great Stack Overflow article. Uh, Michael Chan, who is uh, presented at React, uh, I think it was React Europe last year, uh, did a talk on inline styles. So I reference his uh, his little Stack Overflow answer. I mean, he he could like turn that into an article, and it would be like gold, I think, because uh, he really took a lot of time to, to answer this. It was the guy's question was essentially, what are the best practices for using inline? I don't really know where to start here and how how, how best to do these things. So he kind of he kind of outlines these three elements of style. Um, first being layout. So he's, talk, he's talking about kind of the layout of your app and how you know, how elements and components looks in relationship to others. Um, what he does, what he recommends is that um, you know he doesn't rec actually recommend inlining layout styles. He says just choose one of the many layout frameworks that are out there. All the work that's been done to Normalize browsers to to create grid systems, um, things like that. Mixins for 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 reusable styles of, of lots of um, common widgets that you see out there. He just says choose one of those and go with it, and and build on that if you, as 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 you see fit for your app. Um, the second uh, second is appearance. So uh, the characteristics of an element or a component. He says that this is the most uh, contentious area, sort of, the, of the debate of inline styles. He says that you'll most likely need the assistance of a third-party library like Radium, which, in my case, that was true. I had to, in order to do any kind of things with um, stuff you're used to with CSS, that's what I ended up using. Um, but my question now is, like, why why would we introduce those more more of those libraries that you may not need if you could just take advantage of CSS? Um, what I found is a, a good rule of thumb is to is to use CSS to style the appearance of your component um, with some def some sensible defaults to just kind of hello world the thing and say that this is what my component looks like. Um, add style to it and let the user um, consuming that component um, or the call site rather it could be you yourself using it or someone else using it. 
um, do the customization. And, and, and if you open up the, the ability to inline style it, you give them that specificity that they need in order to really ensure that those styles will be applied to your component, uh, which is what you want to do. You want to empower the user to, of the component to actually you know, make, it, make it look the way they, they want it to look, not the way you chose uh, the defaults to look. Um, and so the third element that he talks about is behavior and state. And um, you know, React's already managing your component state for you. Uh, so I think in this case, um, I, would give, I would give behavior and state the gold star. I would give it an award, inline style award. Uh, I think it's a great place to put your inline styles if you're going to do any. Um, and it's, it's a place that Michael actually says to say start with state when you think about inline styles. Um, and I think it, it, works for, it works for the way I think about things. And I think uh, a lot of people will agree that, that it, if you're co-locating your HTML and your logic already in a component, you know, behavior and state are very coupled to that, that behavior. So it makes sense to have, have your styles kind of go along with that. Um, there's, the, there's a little bit of a... There's, there's kind of two ways you can go with it with this with this kind of method. Um, should you use should you use uh, stateful classes or, or what, what's called stateful classes like dot is depressed if, the, if it's a button, or should you just do inline styles like have an object have a JSON object that um, gets injected when that when that state changes to is depressed. Um, well, there's pros and cons to really both approaches, and I think either either one can work well. Um, you know, for instance, if you have design a design team that um, you know, you don't want them to have to look at JavaScript, or you don't think they're comfortable enough in, in JavaScript land to go in and muck with styles. You could either export the styles as a separate object. Um, you can use class names if you don't want them to look at J any JS at all, and you just want them to look at CSS like they're used to. That's another good use case for that. Um, but generally, I think this is this is a, an area where inline shines a lot and uh, works pretty well. So. Uh, the next little part of this is is the methodologies that are out there, and I, I picked these ones because I think these are the best ones to really highlight. Um, SMACS is the stands for the Scalable Modular Architecture for CSS, um, which um, I put that up the top because I think it, it it's it's a holistic way of looking at how to style an app. Um, the main crux of it is that you have five uh, categories uh, CSS categories. Um, the three in the middle of, the, of those five are the exact same elements that I was talking about. They essentially map directly to the three elements of style that I was talking about that Michael uh, pointed out. Um, it's, it, the, the addition of, of, of the layout and module and state are, are um, base, which is your reset styles. So that's like where you would have um, most of your reset styles. You probably would have some direct element selectors there to kind of even, uh, even the playing field between all the browsers. Um, and then at the lowest la layer, you have theme, uh, theme rules, which are your actual um, you know, the idea is you'd have like a file that had maybe some variables that would that you would store your maybe your um, uh, color values and your your branding uh, information, so that the so that the places using those call sites can actually properly theme your app. Um, and there's other ones like seven to one pattern is a new one. Actually, I haven't um, looked at it too much, but essentially it's it's a very it's a very organized structure for how to structure your um, your your file system and and. How to, how to put your styles in a certain structure so that they make sense. Uh, and BEM, block element modifier, is a, is a great uh, class naming structure for components. So it's another thing to look at it, the more at the component level, sort of, sort of that appearance layer. Um, and atomic design is another cool thing that, that has some good design language. Um, you could probably learn a lot from just looking at all these, but SMACS I would, I would highlight as the most, most helpful for me, at least, was that. Um, and I have used BEM before. BEM was, um, BEM was kind of the first one I picked up, I think, and then started realizing that SMACS was also a good thing to keep in mind as I was building things. Um, so uh, we're going to look at that problem that the first problem is global namespace. So I think this is the, probably the biggest thorn in the side of web developers. I mean, the fact that it's a global namespace, there's lots, lots of errors, points of error for, uh, just from that, just from that, that uh, specific area. Has anybody, anybody used CSS modules? I'm sure a lot, I've talked to a lot of people that use it. I know we, I use it now. Um, so CSS modules is a great way to um, do automatic namespacing of your class names to, to, to basically eliminate the global, the global namespace issue because um, you can use um, you know, an MD5, a random uh, SHA that's generated of the file contents of your CSS file. So anytime a file, file um, changes, it will regenerate a, um, a new version of that a new uniquely identified class name so that there's no chance that someone can guess what that is to override somewhere else in the DOM. Um, it essentially works like this. So you have, I don't know if you guys can see, see it too well, but 
you have a thumbnail um, CSS file. This is an example uh, we throw up. Um, I think there's a came from this this uh, this link down here. Um, and you have a JSX file that's rendering a thumbnail component. It's really just an image, and um, the class name. I'm, I'm showing just the class name usage. Um, the image class that's in the in the CSS file will actually become a, um, a property on the styles object that's exported when it when this uh, thumbnail.css is imported. And of course, it uses require, requires Webpack, the CSS loader, um, to allow you to import CSS into the JavaScript file. Um, and then what you end up with is is a uh, CSS modules will parse it and pull out the um, name of the file and the, also the class name if you choose. And then at the end, you can have the MD5 um, hashed version of the, the CSS file um, to further furtherly unique identify that class name in the global namespace. So it, there's really like very little, um, pretty much no chance that that's ever going to get um, a, a clash between another selector. Uh, and I think, more importantly, what, what we just saw was that it allows you to define a dependency here. So it essentially kind of solves that problem, too. Um, because this CSS will not get applied to the page in the same way that, you know, kind of a traditional SAS import would work. It, it only applies that whenever it's imported into a file. Um, so you kind of solve that. You kind of solve that problem in addition to the global namespace issue. Um, we're going to look at dead code elimination and minification. I group these together because there's a lot of tools that, uh, some tools I found that some of them kind of do a little bit of both, um, and some are specific to just one. Um, and I don't have direct experience using any of these tools. If anybody has, it'd be cool to know. I'd be cool to hear hear for your experience of them using them. Um, CSS Nano uh, looks interesting. It has a it's a primarily a minifier that's really smart with like um, you know using like um, things to shorten um, shorten down. Like if you have like margin right, margin left, margin bottom, margin top, it'll, it'll munge those together into just one margin declaration, which, you know, shortens the CSS. Um, it does a lot of things like that. It's really smart with, with how it handles um, sort of the CSS uh, shorthand rules. Um, it does do a little bit of dead code elimination as well. Um, uh, it looks at, like, unused at rule removals. Um, that's kind of the main thing I found that it does. Um, and essentially, uh, it's built to be a minifier, so that's the primary use case for it. And, and UnCSS and CSS Eliminator really are, you may not, um, there might be some caveats in the web app world for some of these things because it, it requires a static analysis of the resulting HTML and the CSS together to determine which CSS rules are actually not being used. So it'll actually, like, your, your output at HTML, it'll compare that with the CSS and say, I found this, uh, this little, you know, class, I found this, I found this rule in the CSS, but I don't see the corresponding match matching um, element in the DOM of the HTML output. So I'm just going to delete that. That could probably be an issue if you're like, you know, mounting and unmounting your components. You know, obviously that happens a lot with React. Um, so these things may not be like bulletproof solutions, but there are they're things to look into for solving this, um, you know, without using inline and using, using your CSS like you're used to. Um, I would say maybe like, if you're going to use something like CSS Eliminator or on CSS, the best use case is probably like server rendered React apps where you actually know what the HTML is going to be on the first load um, before, the, before the mounting actually happens. Because if it's happening client side, you're not going to know what that is. Um, you're not going to know what the HTML looks like, obviously, on the initial load. So, uh, cool. So, those are the two, two things that get solved there from just looking at some tools that are out there. Um, sharing constants. This is a really cool, this is a really cool thing. So, um, I don't know if you guys can see too much of this, but um, my colleague Richard, he, he's the, he actually wrote the code in the middle here. Um, and actually, I really like this. So the, the cool thing about this is that you have, um, you have like a vars JS file, which has all your theme, um, theme information. So you have like colors that have like, you know, all your theme colors and with a name, uh, you know, a unique name for them, families and sizes for your fonts and stuff. <clears throat> the SAS loader script, so it, it requires a, uh, the SAS loader uh, from Webpack, and um, it has this cool, uh, the Node SAS um, API itself actually exposes this functions um, uh, object that allows you to uh, define custom functions for your SAS files. So on the right is your SAS file. Um, notice that it's saying color dot, it's saying color get colors dot black. And so what it's doing is it's parsing a string of dot separated uh, key values that will map to the, the actual JSON over here. Um, and that's all powered by this little function here that just 
little get function that um, yeah, parses that value that you're passing into it and goes into the theme vars and gets the result out that matches that um, matches that string that's passed in and then returns a, a SAS type of string as a result. Uh, it turns out SAS has like, you know, a color type for specifying color values. So it's an actual object that, you know, is designed to, un to understand what color values mean. So there's some things you could do to make this better for things like colors if you want. Um, right now it's just a simple string. So there's some limitations to this probably with like other types of data that you want, you're trying to store. But it really does a good job of and it, uh, bridging the gap between JavaScript and SAS in a way that I think is awesome because a lot of the other solutions that I found that do this, um, the, there's a, a loader called the JSON to SAS loader, which is a, it's actually what it's inspired by. This, uh, originally we were using this tool, um, and then Richard came up with this code here to provide this. The, the JSON to SAS loader, what, what it'll do is it'll take the values in a JSON object and just like copy them into SAS as SAS variables. So to me that seems like less ideal because you're copying variables in between the two worlds, and so you end up with two sources of that data whereas this is just directly going to the, the source of the data from SAS, which is awesome. So thanks, Richard, for the, <laughs> it's really getting me excited because I think there's a lot of cool things we could build off of that API that Node SAS provides for that. Um, so that's the sharing constants problem. We definitely can solve that. Um, so does anybody, go ahead, yeah. So I, I didn't really see how, how you're sharing the constants. The sharing, the, the constant is getting shared in the sense that um, there's a there's a there's a module here, and then this this is a loader that will uh, compile the SAS and it exposes a new function that is available to your SAS files. This function that gets defined here will actually get called here. So this get colors .black will match this colors .black here, uh, and that's essentially just how it works. It's a way to it's a it's a custom function for your SAS files. Something else that will get pre-processed before the resulting CSS is, is, is actually created. Um, it, it works just like the SAS functions that you're used to using. If you, if you have SAS, um, whatever, depending on your SAS implementation that you're using. Um, I think the original impetus behind uh, wanting to do this was that we, there's, a, there's a map-get function that allows you to, um, SAS has, a very, has another data type called maps, which are synonymous with JSON. It's essentially an object in SAS. And um, the map get function is kind of wonky, though, because you have to, in order to access nested items, um, so if you wanted to get, like, fonts.families.opensans, you'd have to have three map get calls nested inside of each other, because you'd have to do map get fonts, map get families, map get open sans, and it just becomes this long, like, really long uh, call to get that variable, whereas this, this kind of automates that into this one nice little function call, and then you just pass a single argument in, which is the kind of a stringified way to represent how you want to get to that variable inside of the nested structure of the data. So, does that make sense? Uh, okay. Um, does anybody even know what non-deterministic resolution means? <laughs> um, it really confused me at first when I heard this. Uh, so I had to like dig into it. Of course, I'm talking about it. I might as well understand what I'm talking about here. Um, so, it, just to give you a sense of what that means. Say you have a button. Uh, you're trying to do a button, and the, the example that Chris Shadow does in his presentation um, talks about a button, and then you want to style the button when it's inside of an overlay a little bit differently. You want to give it, say, a background color of white instead of black. Um, so essentially what, uh, what he's talking about non-deterministic resolution is what happens if, so say in the order of your CSS, you have the button first, and then the, then the overlay button class, and you have both of those classes applied to the same element, and the order of that doesn't matter. Um, you can have a really button first or a button. It uh, doesn't really matter. It's still going to look at the specificity rules in the CSS and say which one. Um, these are these both have the exact same specificity, meaning they both um, are essentially equal. And so whichever one um, happens at next in the file will be the one that wins. So what happens when you flip these and overlay button comes first and the button comes last? Well, it doesn't because it doesn't matter what the order of this class name is. You, you're you're going to end up with a black button at the end of the day, even though this button isn't in an overlay which is not what you want. So, so really, non-deterministic resolution is not knowing when styles are being unintentionally overridden by selectors of the exact same specificity. Um, so a great article written by Hugo Girardel about, uh, he actually talks a lot about the points I'm making about CSS um, and um, trying to clear up the confusion about what they mean and actually 
CSS and SAS solutions for how to solve those things. Um, and so the example here of, of, I actually think inline works really well for this, so it's actually where I'm going to go with it. Um, the, the way to solve this with inline, and I think this is similar to what Chris's uh, solution is too, is to essentially use inline to style the, style the button in the call site where it makes sense to do it. So if you have your, uh, you have your button class, right, and it just has a generic class name of button, it doesn't know that it's inside an overlay, it shouldn't actually even know because it should be isolated. Um, after all, we're, we're trying to create componentized UIs, we're not trying to create context sensitive ones. Uh, so it makes sense a lot to keep this isolated so that it doesn't know about anything else outside, the, outside its own world. And then inside your overlay component, that's actually where you would add that color, because that's where you know that you need that color on there. So as long as you expose the ability to override that that's, uh, the style um, of a background color on it, it, it can happen here in this, in this ordering. Um, you can change this, this order, which actually um, goes into some, there's some detail that he goes into there from valid use cases that you may want to not let everybody or, uh, override everything. Uh, you might want to let them only override mo most of the properties except for like maybe some, like is depressed property on a button, for instance. You, you want that to always be based on your internal state for some, for some uh, style that you want to have. Um, so there's definitely use cases there for how you might, might want to order things that, that affect the styling within line. So um, this is again another, these, these are the, these last two, um, number six and seven of the problems of CSS. I think these are the last two that are, are really good fits for inline. Um, and you can do them with sat with CSS too, but I feel like inline's a great use, use case for them. Um, and so the last problem is isolation. Um, so isolation is like really the problem about, that really, CSS in general has this isolation issue where you have no component is really immune to the outside world. You can style anything. If you have CSS enabled, you can style anything on your, in your DOM as long as you have a selector that will match what's in the DOM. So um, with CSS enabled, you're always going to have that as an issue. Um, I think CSS modules, um, uh, this, is, this is again going back to that example um, that I talked about where you can let people uh, override most of the styles, but like styles.depressed will actually get applied only when the, you know, the is depressed prop is passed in is true. Um, and this is one way to protect from isolation. So if you have like certain styles that you definitely don't want people to override, then you would do this method of injecting those props at the, at the, last, at the last layer in the style chain. Um, but I think CSS modules too, the reason I put CSS modules here is that I think there's um, narrowing, narrowing scope um, using, uh, eliminating the global scope problem with uh, Namespace class names is a is a great way to is a great way to um, re reduce the pretty much eliminate the problem of isolation as long as you adopt other practices that don't um, that don't allow um, the the styling of things arbitrarily uh, and, and kind of willy nilly. There's actually a lot of things I've been looking into lately, um, which I'll probably get into in a minute here um, around linting. You can do there's lots of tools out there for linting rules uh, for CSS um, that can greatly help you with this kind of a problem. I think because um, Isolation is definitely probably, if not the most hard, hardest problem. It's kind of related to the global namespace issue, um, kind of from a different perspective. But um, yeah, so inline works really well for this, and CSS modules too. Um, so we've effectively solved those two those two problems too as well. Um, so the last argument in favor of CSS I'd like to make uh, is in regards to the future of CSS. I watched a talk uh, called <laughs> uh, "CSS is Dead, Long Live CSS." Uh, I actually have it in my notes here, but um, Guy gave this talk. It talked about um, all the cool things that are coming to CSS. Um, did you know CSS has variables now? You can do variables now in like some of the more modern browsers that uh, natively support it. Um, uh, custom selectors and nesting even is coming to CSS. Um, uh, new pseudo classes uh, that are coming that are going to make things easier to style. Um, you won't essentially you won't be able to take advantage of any of that if you go with uh, with fully inline. Um, and post CSS is a uh, still have to learn. I'm really scratching the surface right now with post CSS. I haven't played with it much, but I'm planning on doing a lot more with it because um, there's a lot of cool things you can do. You can essentially, in some ways, replace all of the SAS functionality that you have now with post CSS and kind of opt into feature by feature as you see fit, as opposed to SAS, where you kind of just get this blanket, you know, API that you uh, may or may not need all the features of. Um, since post CSS is kind of built with you know, modular perspective in mind, you only add the things you want to add uh, to it. So, 
And then CSS Next is a, is a post-CSS module that you can enable um, to take advantage of some of the newer features that currently aren't in browsers yet, but they're still being proposed. So it's kind of like a, kind of like a babble for CSS, it's pretty cool. Um, so that's all I had tonight. Um, I wanted to say, make, let's make CSS great again. Um, there's all my stuff if you want to connect up with me. But, and I'll share my slides as well, too. So I have, um, in addition to the, the videotaping, we can, you can see the slides and all the sources and click on it, all the links and stuff, because a good amount of links that I have uh, cited here that are really good resources to check out. So. Thanks. <laughs>